Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I think there are more of you here than we're at my bat mitzvah, so this is pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> despite my mom trying, I'm sure she did. Uh, hi, my name is Amanda Hill. Um, I am an Android developer at ThoughtBot. Um, so one of you could just take a picture and tweet this so that I can show my CEO. That would be very helpful. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about um, and Kotlin with Android specifically. So if you're not an Android developer, you're not interested in Android, that's fine. I'm hoping to convince you to join the dark side. Um, I'm going to be talking about what a networking view state machine uh, for networking calls on Android. Um, a totally fair and valid first question would be, what is a view state machine? Um, and I am not going to tell you yet. Um, what I will tell you is that it was a solution to a problem that I was having um, in, Android, in my kind of everyday Android development life. Um, and so I think the best way to understand the solution would be to understand the problem. And the best way to understand the problem would be for us to all build an app together, just like we all do, or I do at least in my everyday life. So we're going to build um, this app. Uh, it's called Game of Cones. And it's a pretty simple app with just one screen. Um, we're going to make a network request, and we're going to receive an ice cream object back. The ice cream object has just a title and a picture. Um, but let's get coding. First up is the modeling. Um, this is the emojis doing the Vogue, <laughs> um, or at least my best attempt at that. Uh, so like I said, our ice cream object has just a title and an icon as far as we know. Um, this is the entire app. Our whole company is very small. Um, this is all it does. Uh, so in Kotlin, we're going to write this as a data class. Um, it's an immutable object similar to a POJO. Um, I think the docs officially say that you know, there are a lot of times where you have an object that just holds data, and this is exactly one of those times. Um, along with uh, having this kind of data keyword in the beginning, we get some standard functionality and some utility functions uh, to come along with it. Things like equal and hash code are implemented for us. Um, ToString is implemented canonically the way you want it to be. So this would print ice cream, title, whatever the value of title is, um, icon URL with that value, as opposed to just um, its location and memory in, if you're used to Java, which is never helpful. Um, additionally, we have some um, component n functions, which uh, Kotlin classes have. Um, kind of if you think more of a pair or a tuple, you'd know that there was first, second, or third. In this case, title is component one, URL is component two. A um, couple of things about data classes, since this is a Kotlin conference. Um, the primary constructor, uh, which we have here, needs to have um, variables, uh, vals, or vars. Um, they can't just pass objects through to some other, just so the class can be instantiated with them. Um, and they can't be abstract, open, sealed, or inner. So it's really just meant for this kind of basic POJO, or I guess POCO kind of use case. Um, but now let's start building out our app. Um, like I said, this is a problem that I came across in my everyday life. Um, and in my life, I use the MVP um, architecture pattern. Um, I think it's a pretty, I think it's fair to say that it's a po pretty popular pattern in Android development. Um, I say that based on the itinerary of any Android conference, the weekly Android newsletters always have some MVP blog posts. So I know I'm not alone uh, in this. Uh, there are a lot of positives to the MVP pattern. Uh, it's easy to test. There's a great separation of concerns. Um, as any Android developer will tell you, it takes a lot of your code out of activities and fragments, which is great. Um, just moves it somewhere else. Um, but that's somewhere else can be tested, which is nice. Um, so let's start building uh, ours for this app. So first up, we have our view interface. Um, I've cleverly named it main view. Um, just two simple functions, one for show title and one for show icon. Um, I haven't done any sort of formatting. We're not changing anything here. Um, that's because uh, we can use a library like Picasso or Glide to just take the URL in our activity or our fragment. So just keeping everything kind of a coincidence that it matches our model, if not intentional. Um, next up, we have our presenter. Again, main presenter, which takes um, an object that conforms to main view. Um, we have an onCreate function here. Um, I know there's some debate about naming presenters uh, in Android the same name as the callback in an activity or a fragment. Um, I like to do it. I think it's the clearest way to see what's going on, to try to abstract it or make the presenter dumb or keep things more confusing does just that. Um, so I've named it onCreate. Um, first, we have an ice cream object. We'll get to where we're getting the ice cream object from in a second. But then immediately, we want to show it. Um, so we're going to pass our, the title from our ice cream object through the show title function, and similarly with the icon URL. Now for the where it's coming from. Um, so we don't really have to make any decisions yet where it's coming from. And so we can test it in the future. Let's just start with some interface, um, which has 
a simple function for fetch cone, which returns us one ice cream cone synchronously. Um, so now if we update our presenter, uh, in addition to taking uh, an object that conforms to main view, we'll take an object that conforms to data store, and now we have an idea of where our ice cream object is coming from. Pretty good so far. Next up, testing. We're going to start with our uh, presenter test. Um, the first kind of bit of code here uh, is just setting up the test and things that we're going to need for each case. Um, I use Makito. Again, my life, my every, I have the microphone, so this is how I do it. Um, uh, both main view and data store interfaces, so they're safe to mock. Um, we're not mocking any classes or any concrete classes or anything. Um, and we're just creating a fake ice cream object with some kind of dummy values. Um, first up, we have our onCreate method. There's no kind of cases here to deal with, so it's just the one method. Um, first, we have to stub, uh, next up, we have to stub our response. So whenever uh, fetch cone is called on data store, we want to return our fake ice cream object. Um, then we create our presenter and call on create. And next up, we can verify that the expected behavior, um, which is that our two view interface methods are called, are actually called with the correct values. And then lastly, um, this is something I like to include um, just to kind of as a sanity check, which is verify no more interactions, which just means that nothing else in that method is calling or using or touching at all our view interface. Um, it's just kind of helpful to make sure if this code changes in the future that we're protected and that change will come up in the test so we know what's going on at all times. Um, as promised, we are going to make a network call. Um, we're not just going to this. We actually have to figure out how we're going to implement our data store. So first up is to update this to use Rx. Um, so instead of returning a synchronous immediate uh, cone ice cream object, we're going to return an observable uh, of the type ice cream. And so now if we update our um, presenter uh, with Rx, we're going to notice a few things kind of immediately going on. First is this first bit. Instead of just having an ice cream um, property, which we are getting from uh, the data store, we now have an observable. We have some kind of default stuff that we have to do with observables to make sure our networking isn't happening on the main thread and that our work is happening on a background thread. After that, we have uh, the subscribe function, which takes two closures, one for on success, which is this first one. Um, so we get an ice cream object back. And then just like we were before, we're passing that object through our view interface. Something new we have now, though, is an error case. Um, before, we were just getting an ice cream object. We didn't have this concept of getting it would go wrong. Um, fetch cone didn't throw any errors. We had no, we just assumed it was definitely going to be there. And because of Kotlin, we knew it wasn't null, so we didn't have to think about that. But now we do. Um, and in addition to this, something that isn't maybe as obviously exposed because there's not a closure, but there's kind of this loading possibility. Before we make our network call, we want to show the user that we're starting to do some work here and that they shouldn't leave and that we know what we're doing because we're good developers and we want to keep them in the loop. So what are we going to do next? We're going to update our view interface. Um, we're going to add three methods, uh, show loading, high loading, hide loading, and show error, which takes an error message. Alternatively, you can definitely have a function called uh, you know, loading with a Boolean that's show or hide. I find for testing that's a little bit more difficult because you can't be as assertive you know, which specific view methods are being called. Um, but now that we do have our networking kind of in place in addition to our view interface, you can see that it's starting to look a bit different. Um, it's not necessarily a problem. It's just originally this view interface was all about the ice cream cone. It was all about how we were showing it. Um, but now we're starting to add in all these other views that have to do with networking. And as you can imagine, in a more complicated app than this, every single view interface that deals with networking, which might be most of them, because if it's not networking, the data's got to come from somewhere. So you have to duplicate this everywhere. And duplication is not great. Uh, it's not dry at all. It's very, very wet. So we don't want to do this. But let's keep going with this kind of pattern to kind of see, to better understand, I guess, how and why this is frustrating. So if we update our presenter with it, not too bad. Add a show loading, hide loading on both success and error, and then we just make sure to show our error. Um, our test is, again, a kind of simple update here. Instead of just returning the ice cream object, we're returning an observable. Um, for those of you who have done this, I have intentionally left out um, any code to kind of force the uh, observable to return uh, synchronously or like blocking, because that's complicated and takes away from the picture I'm trying to point, uh, paint here. So understand that this is not totally real code. Um, and then next up, we add methods for show and hide uh, loading. Uh, but the other thing to note here is that the test on create method is now test on create success, which means we need also want to test our error case. This is good. We have you know, better coverage here. Same thing, uh, except our whenever we're fetching the cone, we want to return an error. 
And then the same thing, show loading, hide loading, show error. So everything is good. We did it. We built our app. We used the MVP pattern. It's well tested. It matches what the designer wanted. We earned our paycheck for the day, except that we didn't, because the designer has decided that it's 2017, and people are a lot healthier than they used to be, so we need to start showing the calorie count for each ice cream cone. Um, that is very annoying, um, because we were done. So let's go over the updates that have to happen now. Uh, in our specific app, we have to update our model. In other more complicated apps, this data might have already existed on the model object, so that might not be a change. But we have to update our view interface, we have to update our presenter, and we have to update our presenter test. That's four files, coincidentally the same four files that our entire app consists of right now, which is a humongous amount of change. Um, and if you code review and someone else is coming in to look at your code, they're going to see that you touched all these files, and it's really hard to kind of context switch to see what's going on, because the presenter has networking, and now it has this calorie count, and it's going to look like a lot, when the reality is we want to show one extra text view at the bottom. Um, and so that's kind of hard to, the git diff wouldn't reflect how simple of a change this really is. But the designer wants it, so we're going to build it. So we first update our model object. And like I said, that's kind of just specific to how we've been doing things. But typically, a model uh, update might not be necessary. Uh, then we have to add another method to our view interface. Um, and this is really one of those things about MVP that I don't like. Um, for every, sing every simple, small um, update to your view or your UI, you have to add a method here. Um, that sort of kind of violates the open-close principle uh, in solid, in that classes should be um, open for extension but closed for modification. And in this case, we are directly modifying not only our view interface, but as you're about to see, we're going to modify the presenter as well. So we're not really protecting ourselves against future UI changes, especially one as small as just showing the calorie count. Um, so if we continue going forward, though, our presenter, it's just one more line. So it, it doesn't look that bad. So as you can imagine, the git diff is only going to be, I guess, four lines. But it's across many different files, which is more extreme than is necessary. Um, but on the bright side, if we did run our tests right now, they would fail. Because if you remember the verify no more interactions function, it would catch it because before we added this line, or right after we added this line, we're using our view one more time before we've updated our tests. So let's update our tests. OK, so not too bad. Um, let's kind of take stock of where we are and what we've built so far. Uh, we've used the MVP pattern. Um, we've added networking, and we've updated our UI. And to kind of recap the things that we liked and we don't like, and by we, I mean I, <laughs> uh, the pros are that our, UI, our UI updates are being caught in our tests. Um, the cons to this are that uh, the updates to our presenter violate the open-close principle, kind of. Um, and that our networking view functions are starting to take away from the bigger picture of what's really happening in this main presenter class, which is that we are making a network request, we are handling loading, success, error, and then on success, we're showing some ice cream cone. Um, I realize this chart isn't humongous, but I don't think that everyday app development decisions have to be humongous. It's usually one or two things on either side of a column, and the pros and the cons, and this is what I had kind of up against. And the thing that bo was bothering me the most was this kind of taking away from the bigger picture of what's going on. Um, I work at, like I said, ThoughtBot. Um, we're an agency. And so people reviewing my code are often not on the same project as I am. And so if they're coming in, it's really hard for them to get a sense of what this change is. And you want to make it as easy as possible for someone else at your company, even if you all work on the same product, to come into your PR and be able to see, OK, what's happening? What is the change? How can I assess this and not just say you know, missing a semicolon or spacing is off, but actually provide valuable feedback? So how do we solve this? Networking view state. Um, I told you I'd get to it. Uh, networking view state is a sealed class that I wrote that you can all write. Um, uh, that takes care of all the various stages that our view is going to be in as a result of a networking call and puts it all into a single type. Um, it's a state machine, essentially, is what we've built, because all of these types are uh, mutually exclusive. You can't be both loading and on error. Um, loading can turn to an error and vice versa. Um, this is pretty similar to Swift enums, if you're familiar with iOS or Swift. Um, the key difference here is that in uh, sealed classes, each init, loading, success, and error are their own classes, whereas in Swift enums, uh, each of the cases is just, it's technically a type. But because success, for example, is its own class, it can have a generic type on it. And networking view state does not itself have to be generic, whereas in Swift, the whole enum would have to be generic over a type. Um, and now let's kind of want to focus specifically on this uh, success here for a minute, again, since it is Kotlin conf. Um, 
This uh, is referred to as a declaration site variance. Um, we could have just left it as T without the word out. Um, the word out means uh, that it's a covariant type. Uh, the way to think about this is that um, success is a producer of whatever type T is and not a consumer of it. And in this case, it means that we're just giving out type Ts. We're not taking them in, which I realize is confusing because it's in the constructor. But that's kind of a good men uh, mental model because there's also the um, not covariant, and now I forget the word, for in. Um, does anyone remember what it's called? Contravariant, there we go. Uh, so contravariant is when it's in, which is when you're taking it in as, um, as a consuming it rather than producing it. Um, so now if we go back to our main view, we're going to update it with our newly created network view state. Um, this is my favorite kind of diff. Um, we're deleting everything and just replacing it with a networking view state. Um, it's a variable because we're going to be, uh, we want it to be mutable. We want to be able to set it as the state is changing. Things are starting to get much simpler, which is good. Now if we go to our main presenter, um, we're removing all the code related to um, both showing the success case of showing how we show an ice cream and just simply replacing it with loading um, on success, we pass the ice cream object, and on error, uh, we just pass the error message. Um, this does have some pros and cons like everything else. Um, the benefits of this is that now, in the future, if the designer was like, we want to include all the toppings, the presenter wouldn't have to change at all um, because we're not formatting the ice cream object here at all, assuming that you know, toppings was a property on ice cream, this class is protected now from future changes. So we are now making our code more solid, um, which is really great. But the cons are that we're missing some things here. We're obviously losing some formatting things, but we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, let's first continue to update our main presenter test. Again, just a lot of deletions, um, some simple uh, uh, some simple replacements, uh, adding a loading state and success. And then same with on error. Um, we're removing the other methods that we had before and just asserting what state we are in. So now that we've kind of completed updating our code to protect against future UI changes, which was the goal um, based on that chart that we had up earlier, um, let's kind of go back to the downsides of this new approach. Uh, without those specific view methods, uh, we lose the ability to test them. Uh, our presenter was kind of acting as a sieve or a layer between our UI and our model. And by passing them through the view interface, we were able to test them here in our presenter, um, in our presenter test. So additionally, we also, um, before when we had UI updates, if we change them, those would be caught in our test. So we lose that as well. So by removing them, we not only lose them, but we lose the ability to get any future changes uh, caught here in our tests. So the question now becomes, how can we keep our presenter focused on the big picture like we have it now, but also gain back all the view tests that we lost? Our view tests are homeless. Um, before we introduced uh, the networking view state, like I said, our presenter was the sieve in charge of mapping that object. So we just need a new sieve. And the answer to that is view models. Um, view models everywhere. <laughs> um, remember the covariant type that we saw in the networking view state uh, 30 seconds ago? Um, we can replace that. Um, instead of having it the T item be uh, an ice cream object, we can make it anything we want. So for example, we could make it an ice cream view model. So in our presenter here, instead of passing an ice cream object, we take the ice cream object and create an ice cream view model with it. And so then uh, in our activity, on the success case, we get back a view model. Our view model can look something really, simil uh, really simple, something like this, where it's a class which takes an ice cream object and a context because it's Android and everything needs a context if you want to do just about anything fun. Um, so we have a couple of public methods here, one for title, one for icon URL. And again, it's a coincidence in our case that our data matches exactly the kind of view things that we need from our ice cream object. But in the case for calorie count, for example, you can see we're doing some formatting here. And then we have the ability to test all these public functions. Um, we also have the ability, if we needed to add private methods, to help with the formatting. Um, if you've ever worked on an app with money, you know that money is really complicated. So you can keep all that logic in a view model and how you want to show it based on locale and things like that. Um, so in our ice cream view model tests, we can create, a, again, a fake ice cream object. You can get the context however you want. If you want to use a J unit test, there are ways. If you want to use RoboElectric, I didn't want to make any assumptions. Um, but then we create an object, have an expected and an actual value, and then we just assert that they're equal. So we have our test back. Um, we have a well-tested way of updating our UI and maintaining a high level, while maintaining a high level overview of what's happening. Our presenter is protected. 
We have the same amount of test coverage as before. And um, from a code review perspective, it's a lot easier to see what's happening if a future UI change were to come. Because if a UI change were to come, it would only be reflected in the ice cream view model, which from an English perspective just kind of sounds nicer um, than main presenter being affected by really what is only how we're displaying the ice cream object. Um, but before we really clap, um, I haven't totally been forthcoming with you guys uh, and girls. The one thing that I'm uh, missing and we haven't shown yet is an activity or a fragment. What does this actually look like uh, when we start to implement the view interface? So let's see what that looks like with the networking view state. Um, I, this is a super simple activity that I made in Android Studio. Um, I simply uh, implemented have the main activity conform to main view. Um, and then this is exactly what Android Studio generates if you hit uh, implement methods. So I didn't change any of this. That's why the to do is that way. Um, this is a little confusing. Um, we know what to do in the setter because in the setter, that's where we would take the values or the functions in our view model and use those to set them on actual widgets. Um, so that's where we'd set the text view and you know load from Picasso and things like that. But we don't really know what it means by get. Um, because we don't know where it's coming from because of how everything is kind of set up. It's kind of a weird thing to think about. One option here is to uh, think about get as kind of a default value or an initial value. Um, so in our case, we could set it to init and then do everything we wanted in the setter. Um, but I think we can do better than that, um, and we will, because now it introduces another kind of Kotlin concept here, which are property delegates. Um, property delegates is just a fancier word um, for properties who delegate the responsibility of handling how a property is get and set to some other object. Um, this other object does not have to conform to any interface. It just has to have the methods set value and get value. Um, a lot of you might have, uh, if you've used Kotlin before, you're familiar with the by lazy. Lazy is just a delegate. Um, other uh, delegates in the standard library and the one we'll be using is uh, delegates.observable. Delegates.observable is an inline function whose return type is an instance of observable property. Um, observable property is this class right here. It conforms to read-write property. Um, let's kind of go through this step by step because it's a lot. So first up, we have our initial value. Um, when you create, uh, when you use delegates.observable, it requires an initial property, or initial value, excuse me. One option is to make this type null. If you really can't think about what the initial value can be, you can make it null. There's nothing saying you can't. And because of um, nullability kind of being a first class citizen, you are guaranteed all throughout the future that you won't run into a null pointer exception, which is great. But in our case, the reason why networking view state has an init state and not just loading success and error is because there really is this initial state before we started loading. Um, it's only a few milliseconds if you're on a really nice phone. But if it takes, if we didn't call that method at onCreate, before we start loading, where are we? What are we? What, how does the phone know how to set itself up? Um, we need to tell it that. And so I like to include an init state uh, for networking because it helps kind of reiterate the point that this is a real state that exists as opposed to just allowing it to be null, which I don't think is as explicit um, or declarative. Uh, so next up, and then in get value, we can see return the value. So that's why earlier in the get value in the main activity, we could have just passed it um, init, which is what we're kind of saying is our initial value. Um, next up is the set value. Um, this is where the meat of what uh, an observable property, kind of where its fanciness comes into play. So when you set the value, it first stores the old value. Um, it then checks uh, if before change is false, which you can see um, above is always true, so this should really never happen. Um, then we set the new value, and then we call after change. Um, after change is better than just a regular setter because of this initial setting of the old value. Um, because you get the old value and the new value, which for transitions or animations can be really helpful um, because you know where you're coming from and you know where you're going. So if you wanted to do something really fancy with changing out the letters and the title, you don't have to save any of your state in your activity. It does this all for you um, by using the delegate property. So if we go back to our main activity now, we can update it to say by delegates observable, um, passing it uh, the type. We are init is our initial value. And then next up, we have property, old value, and new value. So now we have the ability, like I said, to transition properly, animate properly, um, do kind of whatever we want here. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, our code is now all the things we wanted it to be, um, protected, um, updatable, testable, and very Kotlin-y. And that's it.
here. This was originally a blog post, um, so if you want to see a different example and it written out, um, that's available. The slides for this talk are already up. That's my Twitter handle and personal website if you like other things that I've made that are pink. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Kind of. I said, uh, so Anko Commons, uh, the library, has the ability to access the context for introspection in certain cases. And I wonder if there's some way that we could access the context for a view model uh, without having to involve RoboElectric and all the yucky stuff that would make our tests suck. Yeah, I have not found a way yet um, because I know that there are some uh, new uh, JUnit uh, frameworks that allow you to they're built kind of for this type of, type of test where you don't really need access to the full uh, set of Android classes and you just need a context object for things like getting resources. Um, that's what I like to do. I realize it's not a pure unit test at that point. Um, but unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, that context is kind of this necessary evil. Um, and until there's a better way, what we call unit tests are, you know, I guess, technically not. Other questions? Hi. Um, Hi. One thing. One thing that wasn't like um, super explicit was like, how, where does the presenter live? Like, how? What is the, its life cycle? And like, uh, how does it get initialized and garbage collected? Yes. Great question. Um, I did not include it, but it would live in the activity. Um, it would live right up. Oops. Sorry. It would live uh, right here. You could live uh, on right above on create as a property on the class. Um, you can use some of the new architecture components, which are unfortunately also named view model in this case because we have a view model. Um, if you didn't want to manage kind of making sure that it was being destroyed and releasing its reference to main view um, on destroy. But that is, that is definitely something that's missing here. So thank you. That's a good question. So, uh, hello. Hey. So I want to know where the networking view state lives. Like is it in the presenter or the view? And also, I want to know what happens when we wrote it. Uh, are there any persistent mechanism that we can use? So uh, the networking view state as a property lives on our view interface. As a class, it can live anywhere in your application. Um, I have a commons package where I leave a bunch of things that aren't really depending on how you structure your application. Um, for me, it's a list of helpers and kind of things like networking view state that don't have a real place to live. So I put them there. Um, and for rotating on view state, it's kind of exactly the same as any other uh, state. So you can store it. You can make it parsable if you'd like. Um, but yes, I think, does that answer your question? Chris, yeah. so how do you test your data store? Because you, you do the asynchronous call. Uh, how do you test it really easy? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, because it is asynchronous, um, I personally have um, a test rule that I use which forces um, my Rx observables to uh, return blocking. Um, I didn't include that because I thought it took away from the scope of the picture I was trying to paint. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, resources online for how to uh, test observables properly, both as their own networking call to make sure that kind of your API is working. But in this case, we're just using it. The reason it's an interface is so that in our presenter tests, we can just have an easy way without focusing on where it's actually coming from or any of the kind of business logic of what a network call is. We know that we want an observable, and when we get one, what does it return? So that's really all that the presenter should care about. Um, if you have multiple view models in your network state, um, how do you handle that? So right now, we just have the just one view model, but if I have more than one, yeah, there. Mm -hmm. If I have more than one, um, how do I handle that scenario where presentation, my activity has different types, but that's just one? Yeah, uh, so like I said, this is not like a class. I wrote this class, so you can write your own class. Um, so you have a bunch of options here. You could have different uh, types of success if they're, as long as they're mutually exclusive, because that's kind of the key here is that they are mutually exclusive. Um, alternatively, uh, T could just refer to another interface or a protocol. So if it was a generic interface that was a view model that was totally empty, then all your other view models could um, adhere to that. If you wanted to get more specific, which I would recommend that you would, uh, 
that's an option too. So you could have an ice cream view model interface, which had, we know it had like get uh, title and picture and then different types of cones could kind of go off of that. Um, but like I said, this is just something that I wrote. Um, I would hope that other people would have, applications would have different needs and they could write it however they wanted. Um, this was just, I thought, the most generic case, which is the most reusable, again, in my applications, but by all means, customize it, change it, yeah. Anything else someone didn't understand? It's possible that someone else didn't understand it, so. No? Oh, yeah. I can repeat it if that's helpful. Uh, yes, you could, and I think another option is to kind of, if you didn't want to do the formatting that requires a context in the view model and just force that to happen in the activity, that's another option, so that you could do to, I haven't played around with uh, the view model, or the new architecture components as much to answer it, uh, to answer your question any better. Would what be testable? Like, right now we have a presenter class where we can just call a bunch of methods on the presenter and then we can test whether or not that works. But with the view, mo or with the view model, you have to have like an instance of a frag to do that, right? Because that's how you're going you to do that. The unit test on the view model should be totally independent of the fragment um, because you're just testing that the functions on the view model return the expected value. Um, it has nothing to do with whatever active, like whatever lifecycle method it's being called on. Um, it's basically just a format test, um, and so it's a way to pass through and assert that our model is being mapped properly and formatted properly. So, like I said, in our example, it wasn't great because we were just it was title and returning title. But in the case of calorie count, for example. The object only has the number 120, and we want to assert that when you call get title on the view model, the value is 120 calories with a capital C. So it's just a formatting kind of wrapper. It's not meant to have anything to do with life cycles. Cool. Well, thank you guys and girls. I appreciate it. <laughs>